So next, we'll turn to Devesh Kapoor, who uh, is director of the Center for the Advanced Study of India at the University of Pennsylvania, where he is also an associate professor of political science and has uh, a fascinating book entitled Diaspora, Democracy, and Development, the Impact of International Migration from India on India. Devesh. Uh, I'll, uh, m most of my remarks will be on, on sort of India, with one exception, uh, largely because I can barely understand India. So, <laughs> you know, uh, thinking about China is sort of beyond me. Uh, one of the things which I think uh, stuff about India, which we sort of discuss a lot, is about the weakness of the Indian state. Uh, and the last few uh, uh, years, the focus on the Indian state has been a lot on c corruption, uh, which has sort of risen very high. And I just want to shift it like, to the com issues of c competence and how do we think about that. And, and we talked about the policies, and I think the bigger uh, difference between China and India is, at least nowadays, is not about policies as much, but about implementation. Uh, now, one of the, the paradoxes about the Indian state is, and state capacity is that it varies very greatly. And the bigger paradox is the Indian state can do complex tasks actually quite well and can do and does simple tasks extremely poorly. <laughs> uh, you know, when you, I mean, just running the Indian elections is actually an incredible organizational feat. India runs its elections better than the United States. There's no two ways about it. And it does it with with a fraction of the resources. It's entirely electronic. And you can imagine that a country that is that, uh, where political contestation is so high, there has never been a case where electoral <laughs> results have been c contested by the loser. And that, I think, itself is a remarkable sort of exercise. Uh, when you conduct elections for 700 million like voters, right, which is about one third of all the voters in the entire world, it's not a trivial organizational exercise, right? Uh, India runs actually now one of the most sort of effective space programs. You know, sort of on a cost-effective basis, it is probably the most sort of effective program. So these are complex organizational tasks, right, which it does at sort of world-class -like level. But when it does, as we've talked about earlier, as others have, you know, basic public services, primary health, primary education, uh, it's pretty pr pr sort of awful. And the question is why? Now, people sort of think that India is this large state. That is simply not the case. India actually, I'll show you, has one of the smallest states in the world in terms of size per when you, <laughs> when you normalize it by population. And the size of the public sector has actually been falling. Uh, if, one, if one looks at the numbers from 1991 when, when economic liberalization began and now, the size of the Indian state has fallen by 10%. In the same period of time, India has added 380 million people to its population. So think of it in one way, right? That you have a country of the size of 400 million people without a single employee. I mean, that's effectively what's happened. It has grown by about 400 million people even when the, when the public sector, which was small like to begin with, is now sort of smaller. Does that include everything. Okay. Everything. Soldiers. <coughs> everything. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, what is sort of interesting is if you think of something like the Indian Indian Army, uh, it has now fairly high vacancy rates, so sort of with the officer corps, which is about twenty five percent with the army. Uh, if you look at numbers on the p p police, uh, uh, you know, on a, when, when you sort of normalize it, India has one of the lowest number of police per, per million population. Now, I'll sort of just, just emphasize 
some of this aspect of, of the police, since one of the core functions of the state like relate to violence, right? When we think about the Weberian notions of, sort of, of the state. So if you think of, of, of the Indian police, because this, this relates to the management of like violence, uh, vacancy rates in India are about half a million, which is about one fourth of the police force is now like vacant, meaning it has that much vacancies. But these vacancies vary sort of enormously sort of across the Indian states. Uh, and but besides that, but day to day policing that is a state -like subject. But there are nationwide sort of equivalents of, sort of, of the FBI. And now India's like federal system is making the creation of nationwide systems much, much harder. Right? So you have institutional barriers. And so what's of course happening is that you begin to see a gradual movement, in fact a very rapid one, to, to like private security services, which are complementing the weakness or absence of the state. So you might think, well, you know, a uh, country as complex as India, uh, policing is poor, is sort of poorly staffed. What does it really, what are the effects on, on sort of violence? Well, it's not self-evident that you have a clear link between state capacity and the level of like violence. So, so here's some of the data which you see, uh, which is on two, on two aspects of like violence, right? One is like riots, right? And riots actually peaked, if you normalize by population, in the early 80s. And I'll give you a little comparison in the paradox with data like from ch China. Uh, and they've actually been falling fairly steadily. Uh, the other line is, 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 a, is a homicides, right? Which is again per million per population. And that too peaked in the early, early 90s. Now you could argue that you know, maybe violence is, is falling now because everyone is out making a buck. They're too like, busy in a sense, uh, making money to engage in violence, but we'll, we'll sort of check those. Now these are forms of public and private violence. Now India also has a forms of political violence, which are part of the insurgencies that India has been afflicted with, whether in the Northeast, uh, whether in Jammu and K Kashmir, uh, someone mentioned c communal violence, which I think is way overstated, uh, especially in American campuses. Uh, and, and so if you look at every form of political violence or electoral, all of these have been falling very sharply with one exception and that's the Maoist like violence in India's tribal areas. Now, now you could say, well, you know, one of the things is uh, that violence might be falling because everyone is being put to jail so you don't have the violent guys who are going to engage in these things. Well, these are incarceration rates in China, India, uh, and, uh, and the US. Here you do see American exceptionalism, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> uh, but you could argue you see Indian exceptionalism as well. It's really, really very small, actually.